sharing good news of great joy to all people. Elation Church. Welcome to Elation Church. We're excited that you're joining in with us this week for worship. And if you're watching from across Davenport, Claremont, or Kissimmee, we invite you to come out and be with us every Sunday morning in the gymnasium of Citrus Ridge Academy. Citrus Ridge Academy is at 1775 Sand Mine Road, just off of Highway 27, and we would love to meet you there. Let's pray together before we look into God's Word. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together. And I pray that you would speak to our hearts as we look into your Word. Cause your truth to come alive on the inside of us. And God, we ask you to work it in our lives in such a way that it changes us from the inside out. Help us to be doers of your word, not just hearers only. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Welcome to week number two in our series that we've entitled Overcome. Now, what does the Bible tell us about overcoming? Do we have a promise in God's word that we can overcome? Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 15, 57. It says this, but praise be to God who gives us strength to overcome through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 5, 4 says, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Romans 8, 37 says, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 1 John 4, 4 and 5 says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Talking about spiritual wickedness and all the things that come against us that are demonically influenced. It says, You're of God, little children, and you have overcome them. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So the Bible is pretty clear about us being able to overcome as a result of our faith in Christ. Let's look at the words of Jesus. He said this in John 16, because if we're going to overcome, that means that something has to be going on that we need to overcome, right? Jesus said this. He says, in the, in the world, you will have tribulation. Now, if you look up that word tribulation in the, in the Greek, it, it's the word thlipsis. And here's what it means. It means pressure. And in our Bibles, it's translated affliction, anguish, burdens, persecution, tribulation, or trouble. And I want you to think about it. Have you experienced any pressure in this world, any any trouble in this world, any burdens or anguish, persecution or tribulation, have you experienced any of those things? Chances are most of us have experienced pressure and trouble in the past recent days, the past week, maybe even today before you are joining us in this study. And Jesus affirmed that. He says, in this world, you will have pressure. In this world, you will have trouble. We live in a fallen, broken world. Sin messed it up. And Jesus knows that we're going to face pressure and trouble. But here's what he says. Here's his advice. In this world, you will have tribulation, pressure, trouble. But be of good cheer. Jesus said, in the middle of pressure or trouble, he's saying, look, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. And here's why. He says, I have overcome the world. See, Jesus came and overcame, he overcame so that we can overcome in him and through him. So he says, even when you're facing trouble, you know, I overcame and in me, you will overcome too. Back to that very first verse that I read that said this, praise be to God. First Corinthians 15, 57, praise be to God who gives us strength to overcome through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now in this series, if you didn't join us last week, this series, we're going through the life of Joseph. And last week we did our introduction. We talked about Joseph's family and how dysfunctional it was. We talked about his dad being a deceiver, a supplanter, and God changing his name, all the things that we went through. I encourage you, if you haven't seen that message, to go back and look at it again. But this is what we realize as we look at Joseph's life as a whole. Joseph always rose to the top. We could call him an overcomer because in every pressure and and trouble that he faced, he always overcame. He always rose to the top. In this series, we're looking at his life and we're, we're seeing his trouble. We're seeing his character or his life principles that develop through his life. And we see his triumph. We see him overcome multiple times in his life. And I believe we can learn some things, learn some lessons from the life of Joseph when we're talking about overcoming. Now, last week in our live service at Central Street Academy, I, I mentioned a guy named Victor Frankel. He was a uh, he was a survivor from Nazi prison camps, and he had said some things, and I I. Uh, You know, I couldn't remember exactly in the live service, but I wanted to share with you one of his quotes. He has multiple quotes that have to do with overcoming and facing trouble and pressure. I want to share this one today. Here's here's what he says. He says, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. See, some of the pressure and trouble that we face, I mean, we don't physically and and personally have the power to overcome and to change those situations. It's not in our control, some of the things. Just like as we looked at Joseph's life last week, the, the dysfunctional family and all the stuff that had gone on in his life, he didn't have power to change that. And when we no longer are able to change the situation that we're in, we're challenged to change ourselves. Here's what we need to realize. When we face pressure or trouble, we have a choice to make. We can either choose to be broken and stay broken and focus on being broken and being overcome, or we can choose to be built up. We can choose our attitudes. We can choose our outlook. We can choose to trust God in what he said. If he says that he overcame and we can overcome, then even in the middle of that pressure and trouble, we can know that in Christ and through Christ, we can overcome and we can look forward to that. So so we can choose to be broken and stay broken or we can choose to be built up during those times of trouble and pressure. And that's what we're seeing in Joseph's life. Joseph's character was built, built up as a result of the pressure and the trouble, see, he, he learned some lessons and applied them to his life. I mean, he learned it from his family and the troubles and the dysfunction, all those things that he faced. He chose to <laughs> believe the promises of God and rise up. What did, he, what did he do? We talked about this last week. Because his father had blamed and made excuses and and all that, he he chose that he wasn't going to do that. And through his life, we see, we never find him blaming other people or making excuses for his lot in life. Last week, he learned from his father to acknowledge God. 
when, when Jacob took the family to Bethel and told about his encounter with God and encouraged them to turn away from idolatry and reminded them of the blessings that were promised to them and their family, the Abrahamic blessings, that they are blessed by God. And they're so blessed that the people around them will be blessed. As a matter of fact, the whole world will be blessed. That's how blessed they are. He had a promise of protection. He had a promise of increase from God. And that was part of the blessing. So, so he took hold of that. And he believed that. Let's pick up the story. We're going to reread some of the verses, but we're moving on to something else that is evident in Joseph's life. Genesis 37, starting with verse 3, says this, Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. And we talked about that robe last week. This, this tailored garment was only worn by owners and managers, and Joseph is working with his stepbrothers and he's wearing the coat of a manager, even though he was the youngest one. I mean, the way the brothers felt, it should have been the older brother that should have this coat of ownership and management. Verse 4 goes on to tell us, but his brothers hated Joseph. They hated him because their father loved him more than the rest of the family. And it says they couldn't say a kind word to him every time Joseph's brothers talked to him. I mean, they were just mad and couldn't say anything. I mean, it was all fighting and fussing and mad. So his family was messed up. Let's continue this week with verse 5. It says this, One night, Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. I mean, this... This dream revved them up to the next level. Listen to this dream, Joseph said. We were out in the field tying up bundles of grain, and suddenly my bundle stood up and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. So this is a dream. Joseph and his brothers are out in the field. They're harvesting bundles of grain. And, and in his dream, all the bundles are just being gathered and laying there. The one, that, the one that Joseph bundled all of a sudden stood up by itself. And then all the other bundles of grain moved around and bowing. They, they started to bow to Joseph's bundle of grain. His brothers responded, so you think you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated Joseph all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. So this says that Joseph is talking about, he's having dreams. It's not just one dream. We've got we got a picture of this one dream that he told him about, but his brothers are like, oh, he's a dreamer. He's, he's having a lot of dreams like this, and they got mad at every single one of them. We don't know every dream that Joseph had, but, but we do have this one recorded. And his brothers' hate of him increased because of his dreams and because he talked about his dreams. Soon Joseph had another dream. And again, he told his brothers about it. Listen, I've had another dream, he said. The sun, the moon, and 11 stars bowed low before me. This time he told the dream to his father as well as to his brothers. But, but his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that, he asked. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. So we see 
that in the middle of everything going on, in the middle of the pressure and the trouble and the dysfunction of his family, Joseph begins to have dreams. And the two dreams that we know about are giving Joseph a mental picture of overcoming, of rising to the top. And we, we can look at Joseph's life, and as we know the whole story, we can look and we can be pretty confident to say, he didn't just dream these dreams and forget them like a lot of dreams that you and I have when we eat pizza too late or something. We have these crazy dreams. We might be able to remember them for a day, but there's very few dreams that I have had that I, that I remember to today what that dream was. Most of the time I can't even remember it. When I woke up, I just know I had a dream. Well, it's different with Joseph. See, these dreams gave him mental pictures of overcoming and he carried these dreams with him for the rest of his life. It wasn't just one day or a week. Or, no, we know for sure that he carried these dreams with him for, for over 20 years in his story. And the dreams are fulfilled. Almost 22 years after he had these dreams, they're fulfilled. So he, he has a mental picture from the dreams. And we're going to talk about dreams and visions today. And I believe Joseph's dreams got him to the point where his attitude was like this. No matter what happens in my life, I'm going to rise to the top. I'm going to overcome. I mean, I've got this dream. I've got this mental picture. I've got this vision and, and it doesn't matter. I mean, cause he got the dream in the middle of trouble, in the middle of his brothers hating him and and all that. He, he got the dream then and he's like, well, no matter what happens, I'm going to rise to the top. I'm going to overcome. And I believe that became his life attitude after this series of dreams. And as I thought about this, I, I thought about Proverbs 29, 18 that says this, where there is no vision. Now that Hebrew word vision is translated mental sight. So it's a mental picture, a dream, a revelation, a prophetic word, where there is no, now get this, where there is no vision, where there's no mental picture, where there's no dream, where there's no revelation, where there's no prophetic word, the people perish. Now that word perish means to loosen or dismiss. So, so if you have a gathering of something and all of a sudden you have a loosening or a dismissal, that means it's falling apart. And now I know in context that this is talking about without it's talking about the law and it's like without a, without a mental picture, without a prophetic word of, of what morality should be, the Ten Commandments, without that picture, the people will fall apart. The, the unity will fall apart. The gathering together will fall apart, but I believe it extends beyond that. And I'm going to apply it to Joseph here because if he had no vision, if he had no mental picture of him always rising to the top and always overcoming, then these dreams would have been worthless in his life. And if they were worthless dreams, they wouldn't be recorded in the word of God where there's no vision the people perish. Where there's no vision, people fall apart. So now Joseph has a vision. Now, how does this apply to our lives? Because we're not just doing a historical study of Joseph, even though that's fine. But I believe God's word speaks to us, even though it's telling us about Joseph and his life and what he went through God is speaking to us through his word. God's word transcends culture and, and time. 
to speak to our hearts. And as Joseph came to the point where he said, okay, I'm, I'm a blessed person because I'm the, what is it? The great grandson of Abraham. And this is for, this is for me that God's going to bless me and I'm going to bless those around me. God's going to do that through me and I'm going to, I'm going to be protected and I'm going to increase. And he's, he's, he's got that mental picture and now he's having dreams of him rising to the top. See, just like that, God tells us what can be. Just like we've looked at these verses about overcoming. I mean, I see these verses as promises from God that in Christ, because Christ overcame, he overcame so that I can overcome. And I'm going to thank God who, who makes it possible for me to overcome in Christ. And I mean, we're supposed to overcome. God's word tells us what can be. And not just in the area of overcoming, but in every area of our lives. I talk about, I talk about peace a lot because that's something that we can grab onto. I mean, if, if we're being overcome with worry and anxiousness, if that's, if that's the pressure that's on us is making us worry and be anxious... God's word tells us that that's not what God wants for us. See, God tells us what can be. Jesus said that the peace I gave you will surpass understanding. God's name is Yahweh Shalom. God is our peace. I mean, there's so much about the peace of God. Fear doesn't come from God. The Bible tells us that in Timothy. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear that would lead to like worry and anxiety. God hasn't given us that. He's given us love and power and a sound mind. God tells us what can be, what he wants for us, what he has promised for us. Right in the middle of our pressure and trouble, God tells us what can be. He tells us that we can overcome. I want to share a verse with you. 1 Peter 1, verse 13. It says this. See, God tells us. His, he gives us His promises. He tells us what life can be. And then He also encourages us in this verse to gird up the loins of your imagination. What is it? What is... Uh, well, I use the word imagination... <laughs> It says, gird up the loins of your mind. And when you look up the Greek word and look at the definition, it means deep thought. It means imagination. So this is what God is telling us. He's telling us to gird up the loins of our mind, our, our deep thought and our imagination, what we are thinking about, what we are imagining. He says to be sober. He says, rest your hope. And we remember that that word hope means confident expectation. It's not a hope so hope. It's, it's to be confident that you're going to see the goodness of God. You're going to see, in this case, where we're talking about in this series, you're going to see you overcome because you're confidently expecting to overcome even in the middle of the pressure and the trouble because God has overcome. Jesus overcame so you can overcome. So gird up the loins of your mind, your deep thought, your imagination. Be sober and rest your hope, your confident expectation fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And what is grace? What's, what's our deep thought and imagination and our confident expectation? What is it founded upon? Well, it's found fully upon God's grace. His acts of kindness and favor towards us that we didn't work for or earn or deserve. He doesn't owe it to us, but he's just a good God. And he's made all these great promises and he's told us what can be. He's given us this picture of what can be and in 1 Peter 1.13, it's telling us 
that our deep thoughts and our imagination should be wrapped around the goodness of God and his promises. And then we're going to have confident expectation fully on his work. This is awesome. I hope I explained it in a way that you can receive it. But that's what God wants for us. Just like Joseph had a dream that gave him a vision of what could be and it put in him that he's going to rise to the top and he's going to overcome no matter what he's facing. God has put similar things that, uh, that apply to every part of our life in the word of God. He's already given us everything we need for life and godliness to live our lives. His promises are there. He's already paid for them and, and gave them to us and promised them to us and that's his grace work. And our deep thought and imagination needs to be focused on what God has told us can be and what God wants for us. Now, when you start talking about that, I tell you, everybody's not going to celebrate your vision. <laughs> just, like, just like Joseph, he had this dream that I'm going to rise to the top. I'm going to overcome in every situation. He had people around him that they were wanting to put him down. They weren't, <laughs> when he starts talking like that and telling his dreams, when you start talking about God's promises in the middle of your pressure and trouble, there's going to be, there's going to be people who begin to question you. There's going to be people, there might even be people who begin to mock you. Oh, yeah. You just, yeah, you, you living in some dreamland, aren't you? I mean, I can see what you're going through. You, you can't tell me that you're going to overcome. I'm, I'm seeing it. You know, people are going to mock you. Some people might even become angry at you. Some people might become jealous of you. Some people might even fight against you. They might fight against you. I mean, I saw an occurrence of that. For, I mean, one of one of my friends today was coming against another preacher because that preacher was making statements based on God's promises and God's truth and what God wants. And, and I, had a, I had a pastor friend of mine that I've known a long time, and he's just bashing this other pastor. And everything he said that he said, I knew scripture to back up why he was saying those things, his his confession of his faith in what God had said. He was putting his words in agreement with what God had promised. And then other preachers are fighting against him on a regular basis. So everybody's not going to celebrate your vision. Everybody's not going to celebrate your dream. When you choose to put your words in alignment with what God has promised and God said, it's, there's going to be people against you, questioning you, mocking you, becoming angry, even fighting against you. Let's go back to John 16, 33. Jesus said, in the world, you will have tribulation. You'll have pressure. You'll have trouble. But be of good cheer. Last week, Jeffrey thought I was going to say this. I'm going to say it this week. Cheer up, buttercup. Jesus said, Jesus said, you're, you're going to have pressure. You're going to have trouble, but cheer up, buttercup. Be of good cheer. Right in the middle of your pressure, right in the middle of your trouble, cheer up because I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. Here's my question. If Jesus told us to cheer up in the middle of our pressure and trouble, then it has to be possible. Because if it wasn't possible, Jesus wouldn't tell us to do it. Jesus wouldn't command us to do it. I mean, that's, that's a command. It's not a suggestion. It's not a spiritual suggestion. Jesus is saying, in this world, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have pressure, but cheer up. That's his command. Cheer up. How can you cheer up? while in the middle of the time when you're facing pressure and trouble, when you're experiencing that, how can you be of good cheer? Through your vision? 
through your vision because you know the promise of God and you have set your deep thought and imagination at work on, based on the grace of God, based on what God has promised and based on what God has done, you set your deep thought and imagination on that to the point that you can see. You can see it. You can see what your life would be like in, if you have peace in the middle of the storm. You can see what your life would be like if you can overcome. What, what will it look like if you're not under the pressure and the trouble? What does overcoming look like? Because that's what God has made available to you. So your deep thought and your imagination, you build a mental picture, a vision of what that life looks like with the promises of God fulfilled in your life. And even in the middle of the pressure and trouble, because of your deep thought and imagination, focused on the grace of God, and now you've got a confident expectation, a hope in that. Now you can see what it's like. You can see that picture that God has given you. And you can confidently expect to overcome this situation that you're in. So since you're confidently expecting to overcome in Christ and through Christ, through this vision, through this mental picture of what your life can be like, well, then you can be of good cheer even in the middle of your pressure and trouble. I believe this is a lesson that we can learn. And we're going to see through Joseph's life that this mental picture of him rising to the top and overcoming, I mean, it, it's not only just a good thing to think about. I mean, we see it happening time and time again in his life. And here's the good news. We can see it happening time and time again in our lives. In Christ, we can rise to the top and we can overcome. I don't care what the pressure or the trouble is. Let's pray together. God, thank you for today. Thank you for your truth of your word. Help us to take hold of it. Help us to apply it to our everyday lives. Not just be hearers of your word, but be doers of your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thanks again for joining with us this week here at Elation Church, and thanks for being a part of our Elation family. If today's message was an encouragement to you, would you consider sharing it with all of your social media friends? I mean, all you have to do is hit that share button right under the video. In doing that, you'll be coming alongside of us in our mission of bringing good news of great joy to all people. We'll see you right back here next week at Election Church. This online worship experience was brought to you by the friends and partners of Election Church.